Genesis chapter 34 this morning. Genesis 34. And we're going to touch on the beginning of chapter 35 as well when we get there. I don't think that it's an accident or a coincidence that we reached this point in Genesis the same week that our men's studies ended. I certainly didn't plan it that way, and I probably couldn't have planned it that way, but the same type of conversations that we've had in our Wednesday morning group and our Thursday evening group and the book that we've studied, I think there's some significant overlap between that study and our passage today in Genesis 34. The fact is that many of the mostly negative actions of the men in general, and the fathers in particular, that we're going to see in Genesis 34 correspond very closely with those principles from that book. The first week that we met, not that I expect any of the men who were there to remember it, but back in July, the first week we met, I shared a quote from a different book from the one we were reading together. This is from a book by Robert Lewis called Raising a Modern Day Night, and it's a definition of manhood. He said, a real man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and expects the greater reward, God's reward. And in part based on his definition, but in part based on this passage, I'm going to take that definition and adopt part of it and expand other parts of it. And please don't panic, but I have six main ideas for you today. I know that's twice as many as normal. It's okay. I promise it will not be twice as long as normal. But here are the main points that I have for you. First, godly men accept responsibility. Godly men accept responsibility. Number two, godly men reject passivity. They reject passivity. Number three, they speak the truth. Number four, they do not seek revenge. Number five, godly men focus on others. They focus on the welfare of others. And then number six, godly men repent. And I'll share the references as we go for each of those. I'm not going to spend time at the moment reading the passage. We're going to go through it verse by verse. But I'd like to begin as we launch into our study for today with a word of prayer. So would you join me in praying, please? Our Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful even for the ugly chapters in your word. Lord, you have said in the New Testament that all scripture is profitable. It's beneficial to us. It's helpful to us. That it helps us in doctrine, in correction, for instruction, for reproof. So that we will know the truth, that we'll know what's wrong in our lives, that we'll know how to fix what is wrong, that we'll know how to do what is right. So Lord, may we be fully equipped by your word today. Please give us understanding of this passage. Help us to recognize the ugliness of sin, but help us not simply to focus on that. Help us to see what you have for us, how we should respond how we should respond to our own sin. Father, I ask for you to send the help of the Holy Spirit this morning for me as I teach, for each person here, as he or she listens, that you would give us receptive hearts that are ready to obey and to obey you fully. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who were here last week, we left Jacob, and he had headed back north. He had met Esau. We talked about forgiveness and reconciliation when we dealt with chapter 33. And he said, yeah, Esau, you go ahead and I'll see you soon. And to the best of our knowledge, at least as the Bible records it, he never went. Instead, he went to a place called Succoth, which means booths, set up a little farmstead, lived there for eight to ten years, we think. And then finally made his way to Shechem. And that's where we left him last week, Shechem. 
And I don't know how far Shechem is from Bethel, where he's supposed to be, because some of my commentaries say it's 15 miles, some say 20, some say 30. The point is, he's not far. He's not far from where God had told him to go, but he didn't go all the way. He is not fully obeyed. He's back in the promised land. He even built an altar, which is good. He built an altar, and he named it, incorporating his new name, saying, God, the God of Israel. He did some good things, but he is not completely obeyed. Warren Risby said, it's obvious that Jacob was not in a hurry to obey God and return to Bethel. And because he tarried in that part of the land, meaning Shechem, his daughter Dinah was raped. And two of his sons became murderers. It was an expensive detour. He went on to say, when we disobey the Lord, we put ourselves and our loved ones in danger. And we've seen this before in the book of Genesis. Abraham, when he went to Egypt, put Sarah in danger. That was back in chapter 12. <laughs> Abraham did the same thing in chapter 20 when he went to Gerar. Lot did the same thing to his family by facing his tent toward and eventually moving into Sodom. And then Isaac, second generation of the patriarchs, did the same thing to his wife, Rebecca, putting her in danger in jeopardy in Gerar. So this is not new, but it is yet another indication that we as men, we as fathers, seem to be very careful because sin in our lives will have effects on our family. And that doesn't just go for fathers and husbands, that's anyone. Your sin will affect those around you, and especially your family, whom you live with. So let's go to verse 1 of chapter 34. And our first point, godly men accept responsibility. Genesis 34, 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hevite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this young woman as a wife. Who's Dinah? We had her introduced a few chapters ago. She's the only named daughter of Jacob. And, significantly, she is the daughter of Jacob and Leah. For those of you who may not remember or may not be familiar with the story, Jacob ended up with two wives and had children by four women. And Leah was not the favored wife. Rachel was. We've already seen last week when Jacob put the family in order, he put the ones who were least important to him up front when he was going to meet Esau. And that was the children of the handmaids. And then next in line was Leah and her children. She had six sons and a daughter. So those seven children did not seem to be quite so important to Jacob as the other children would have been. Someone said Dinah appeared to have been of little interest at all to Jacob. This coupled with the fact that Jacob was not where God wanted him to be geographically or spiritually left her particularly vulnerable. Fathers of daughters. If you don't pay attention to your daughter, someone else will. If you don't take interest in her as a person and offer her love and support and physical affection, someone else will. There's a role that we as fathers need to take and need to take specifically in the life of our daughters. Dinah, it says, went out to see the daughters of the land. That seems innocent enough. If I could put it in modern terms, she wanted to go with her friends to the mall. The only problem is she didn't have any friends. And based on the record of scripture, she didn't have any sisters either. So she's growing up in a household with 11 brothers, no sisters, and the Bible does not tell us, was this an act of rebellion? Was she sneaking off? It doesn't say that. So all I know is that she went by herself into the city. It was a wicked city. It was a city of the Canaanites. And she was not supposed to, as a, a young single girl, she was not supposed to be unaccompanied. An older term would be a chaperone. She was supposed to have somebody with her, a brother, a parent. And yet there she is, going to see the women of the land, the daughters of the land, by herself. 
Whose responsibility was it that she not go off by herself? Jacob's and Leah's. So again, I'm not trying to read into it. I don't know how it came about that she was there by herself, but she was. And ultimately that responsibility was her parents. What happened here illustrates how debased the Canaanite cities were. We look around and we see an immoral world around us, don't we? Well, guess what? In that time and place, any unattended female could be raped. And in the later interactions of this chapter, neither father nor son, meaning Shechem or Hamor, seemed to have any motive to apologize. It just seemed like this is common and fair. I'm not saying that's right. It certainly isn't. But that's how wicked the culture was. A girl couldn't be out by herself because if she was, anyone could take advantage of her. It was just the way the society functioned. And that's where she went to visit the daughters of the land. And Shechem, who's that? That's the son of Hamor. Well, who's Hamor? Hamor is, says, the prince of the country. And obviously he was important. We'll come more to those two in a moment. But what did he do? What are the verbs there? Saw, took, the ESV says seized, lay with, violated. He humiliated her. Some of the other modern translations say he raped her. This is a despicable act. It is wrong. I don't think anyone in the room, and probably most people around the world in society, would not think that this is okay. He was sinning against Dinah, first and foremost. He was also sinning against her family. And the consequences that would come to him and his family and her and her family were beyond what anybody imagined at that point. Now, what's a little surprising is that after mistreating her in such a horrible way, it says he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to her. It seems kind of odd to treat her that way and then lock her in his house. We find that out later in the chapter that he has kept her there in his house, and yet he's showing her love. A couple of points there to apply. One is that it's possible, as we've said in previous chapters, we talked about this when we were talking about all the different wives, all the different women that Jacob had children with in that household, that it is possible for a man to be attracted to a woman and to show kindness to her out of impure motives. You say, well, duh, yeah, that's what happens, can happen. They have motives that have nothing to do with real love. And so in desire for a woman to have a connection to a man, there are times that she'll just kind of overlook the fact that I don't think his motives are pure. Again, what was going on inside Dinah's heart in her mind? I don't know. But do any men or women in the room, we need to be very careful. Instruction of scripture, if I can skip ahead to marriage for a second, husbands love your wives. Protect them. Peter says, honor them. And if we can apply that very broadly, I know it's specifically husbands to wives in both those passages, but men should do everything possible to protect and care for women and girls. And girls, unmarried girls in the room, if you see that a guy is not doing that, if he's not looking out for you and putting you first, get rid of him, okay? That's your application for today. The fact that he declared his love for Dinah could not excuse the evil that he had done. What was his problem? And frankly, what was the problem with all the men in this chapter? They did not have self-control. We're going to see the same thing in the sons of Jacob when we get later in the chapter. He did not have self-control. He was consumed by his lusts. Many of us would do well if you've never memorized this verse. 2 Timothy 2.22. What reference could be easier to remember than that? 2 Timothy 2.22. Look at it up there. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 
that verse is a call to purity, to flee youthful lusts. When we get toward the end of the book and we start studying Joseph, we're going to see somebody who did that. Case study of fleeing youthful lusts. That's Joseph. I'll remind you that when we get there. But for now, know that Shechem was consumed by his lust, and yet, for an unbeliever who's just done a terrible thing, I suppose he's acting nobly that he wants to care for her and marry her. The other possibility is that he's still so consumed by his lust that he just wants to have her as his wife. I don't know. Point number two, headed to verse number five. Number two, godly men reject passivity. What's passivity? Doing nothing. It can be laziness, but it doesn't have to be. Passivity. Look at verse five. And Jacob, that's Dinah's dad, heard that he, Shechem, had defiled Dinah, his daughter. That's all it says for the moment. Let's keep going. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Does that strike anybody else's eye? He held his peace until his sons came in from the field. Now, I, there are arguments you can make. One is that his sons were old enough to be considered men in that culture. So they would have made a decision together as a family. Grant you that. He couldn't have done anything about the situation without them because he's just one man and this is the prince of the city. So I get that too. But I would hope that any man in the room, and certainly any man in the room who has daughters, if something like that had happened to your daughter, I hope you wouldn't just hold your peace and wait for the sons to come home. Verse 6. Then Hamor, the other father involved, the father of Shechem went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry. That's the result I would expect. Because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. The sons were filled with grief and fury. Or another translation says they were shocked and furious. Jacob was passive. He seems to have lost control over the behavior of all of his children. Someone suggested that Jacob's refusal to do anything will encourage two of his sons to do something, to do something terrible in response. So Hamor comes out, makes no apology. We're going to see no apology for his son's behavior. Just says, hey, my son wants to marry your daughter. Let's talk about it. A little bit of a side note, but this is the first time Israel has been referenced as a nation. God had promised Abraham, I will make a nation of you. And this is the first time that Israel is being described as a nation that he had done, he, Shechem, had done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Verse 8, but Hamor spoke with them, meaning the brothers, and Jacob's still there, spoke with them saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take your daughters to your, our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. He's saying, make marriages with us. Your daughters, marry our sons. Our daughters, marry your sons. And it's going to be good for business. We're all going to prosper. We're going to all be one big happy family. Verse 11. Then Shechem, he just couldn't wait any longer. He needed to talk. Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me, but give me the young woman as a wife. I'm guessing that Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there are some parallels here, aren't there? Anybody remember Jacob? wanted to marry Rachel, and the whole interaction with Laban, it's kind of similar. I will go above and beyond for the bride price. I just want to marry your daughter. And that's what Shechem is saying here. Third 
third point, godly men speak the truth, which is the opposite of what, of what we're going to read right now. Verse 13, but the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. But if you will not eat us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. It says the sons of Jacob spoke deceitfully. Where do you suppose they learned how to do that? They learned from their dad, Jacob, and from their uncle, Laban, and others who have been deceitful as we've studied this family. They're saying, we can't do what you're asking because you're not circumcised. But if you become circumcised, we can all be one happy family. That's what they're saying. I'll point out, Jacob's still not saying anything. He says, we can't give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. Now, there's a physical element to that, but that really wasn't the point, was it? God gave Abraham the sign of circumcision as the symbol of the covenant, the promise that he was making. He had said, I'm going to bless you richly. I am going to give you a land. I am going to give you many descendants. I'm going to make a nation out of you. I'm going to give you all the land you can see if you go this way, that way, all the promises God had made. And they said, and here is the symbol. Here's what's going to set your people, your family, the nation I'm going to make out of you, I'm going to set them apart this way. All the males are going to be circumcised on the eighth day after they are born. And Abraham obeyed. And he had all the males, including himself, circumcised. And then from then on, any boys who were born were circumcised on the eighth day. It seems that Jacob had done that much right, because it seems that all his sons had been circumcised. It also stands out to me, though, that they don't see a spiritual significance to that. They're just saying, hey, you need to be like we are. And they're using it as an excuse. Some of you know the story. You know where we're going with this. But they're claiming you have to be like us, even though they had no idea, probably, who the true God was who had given them this sign and given them this promise, this covenant. What would have been wrong with them becoming one people? What if they had been sincere and just said, okay, we want you to be circumcised so you can be like us, and then we will intermarry? Would that have been so bad? Yes. Why, though? It's not that the children of Israel were superior to all the other groups. They weren't. If you look at their behavior morally, we're going to see in the rest of the chapter, they're horrible. But God had chosen them, and God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and then even to Jacob, that from your descendants, you are going to have an offspring. You're going to have a seed, is the way it's been described all the way since the beginning of Genesis. There was a seed coming, and God demanded... He expected his people, those who were believers in him, those who were righteous, to be separate from the rest of the world around them. We have commands later in the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament. Be holy because I am holy, says the Lord God. Be separate, be different from the world around you. That's what they were missing. The spiritual component, the reason for circumcision wasn't God wanted to do something cruel or just make them misfits, God had an idea. He, we get to it in the New Testament, don't we? The circumcision of the heart. That our hearts would be softened. That the flesh, the old nature, the sinful part of us would be cut away, would be removed. And that's an ongoing process that we call sanctification, to become more holy, to become more set apart, to become more like our Savior, Jesus. And what they did was take what was holy, what was special that God had given them as a sign of the covenant, 
and they're about to use it as a weapon. They had no regard for the promise that God had given them and the symbol of it. So what would have been wrong if they had intermarried? The same thing we've seen all along. Satan is trying to corrupt the seed to prevent the Messiah from coming. They needed to remain separate. Would it have been that bad for one daughter to marry the Canaanites? Maybe not with the principle involved. God did not want them to intermarry. And we find out later as we read through the next books in the Bible, God didn't want them to intermarry because it almost always brought them to spiritual idolatry. Read the rest of the Old Testament. What are you going to read? The cycle of apostasy. That they would just keep going back to worshiping other gods. To the extent that when God gave them the Ten Commandments, what's the first one? You shall have no other gods before me. We'll come back to that when we get to the next chapter. They're going to put away their gods. But back where we are, Jacob's sons are thinking about revenge. They are planning revenge. And they're being dishonest about it. Shechem can't think of anything except Dinah. So they make a deal. Yes, let's do it. You're on. Let's go. Verse 18. Their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. So the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. At least, as reputation goes, he was an honorable man. Everybody looked up to him. Everybody in the city respected him and his dad, Hamor. Verse 20. They have a big sales job ahead of them because they have to go tell the people of the city, here's what we're going to do. So here it goes, verse 20. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for indeed the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of the city heeded Hamor and Shechem his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. It's a great sales pitch. Here's how we're going to get rich. Oh, there's this one thing we have to do. And this is how we're going to be rich. That's basically what he's doing. It's going to go great. We just have to do this one little thing over here. And he sells it, and they go for it. This is at the gate of their city, kind of like town hall. And they start off, these men are at peace with us, because he thought they were. We know, we've read it, we know that the sons of Jacob were acting deceitfully. They didn't know that. It'll all be ours. It'll be great. Fourth point, godly men do not seek revenge. Verse 25 of our passage. Now it came to pass on the third day when they, that is the men of Shechem, were in pain that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, this is significant, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, and their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field, and all their wealth, and their little ones, and their wives. They took captive, and they plundered even all that was in the houses. On the third day, imagine the primitive surgical conditions. And the men who had been circumcised are at their lowest point in the most pain if there's any infection, it would have set in by the third day, and they are unable to defend themselves. And these two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, come in, and they wipe out the men of that city, including Hamor and Shechem. Look at the verbs here. Killed, plundered, took, took captive. They kill the men, they steal the livestock, and they kidnap the women and children. These are the people of God. This was very much excessive vengeance. They didn't have the Mosaic Law yet. 
But that idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth that comes later was intended to limit. Because when somebody hits us, we're going to hit them back hard, is the idea of the world. And they went out of control, taking revenge on the men of Shechem. Someone said, sexual sin is devastating because its consequences are so far reaching and it does, it affects so many people. Tragically in this, this example. How are we supposed to respond? Men, women, people of God. We're supposed to get out of the way and let God take care of the vengeance. Romans 12. 17 to 21 says, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the New Testament answer. These men were enraged. Do we understand why they were mad? Yes. Do I fault them for that? No. There is such a thing as righteous indignation. When we get to the New Testament, it doesn't say don't be angry. It says be angry, but don't sin in your anger. And boy, did they sin in their anger. Further McGee said, the very minute we attempt to take revenge and get vengeance, it means we are no longer walking by faith. We are saying that we cannot trust God to work it out. One other thing I'll point out from that paragraph is the sons of Jacob. What did they do? Because we know Simeon and Levi were responsible for the murders, the massacre. But it says the sons of Jacob, so at least their other brothers and probably all of their half-brother and whole brothers went out and plundered the city. They were all involved. Point number five. Godly men focus on the welfare of others. Well, let's come back and focus on Jacob again. Look at verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. And their response. But they said, Should he treat our sister like a harlot? So there is a serious exchange of words when the boys get back from raiding and pillaging and stealing and killing. And what is Jacob's response? Has he had anything to say yet to anybody about his daughter being raped? No. Does he say, boys, what you've done is wrong? No. Did you notice the pronouns in the paragraph I read? I have them underlined in my notes here. You've troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites, among the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. Where is Jacob's focus? Himself. Have we seen this before in Jacob? Yes, we have. He has made some good steps, but like us, he keeps falling. Gets back up, walks with the Lord, falls. And what keeps getting him in trouble is his own selfishness, his self-focus. So his daughter has been violated, doesn't seem to care about that. His sons have run amok, killed people, kidnapped people, stolen livestock, and where's his focus? What's his concern? You guys, people are gonna think bad of me. As well they should. He's not going to get parent of the year, is he? Now, he has a legitimate concern. What did they just do? They came into Canaan as strangers, and they wiped out an entire city. 
in an underhanded way. So the other nations of the Canaanites could easily come against him. And yes, he is few in number. Yes, he could be wiped out. Except, did God promise him or did God not, God not promise him, I will protect you. I will take care of you, Jacob. And without saying it in so many words, the Messiah is going to come through you. Through one of these boys. You've troubled me. Someone said we sometimes get a wrong perspective of sin and our actions. We think only of the effect that our sin is going to have. You've seen that. You've seen that in yourself. You've seen that in your children. Much more concerned over the consequences of the sin rather than the sin. David Guzik said there was no concern for right and wrong, for God's righteousness, or for the death and plunder of innocence. He's concerned only about himself. And the boy's response, they weren't going to have any of that. Is that how they should be allowed to treat our sister? No. But their response was wrong, and it was way out of hand. Can't use said, what a mess. And the whole thing is Jacob's fault. If Jacob had gone to Bethel in full obedience, none of this would have happened. The rape, the destruction, the genocide, the disgrace were all due to his disobedience. The good news of the gospel is that we don't have to stay the way we are. No matter how many times we fail the Lord, we can go home again if we truly repent and obey. Before we turn the page to chapter 35, I want to say it's not that Jacob was responsible for his son's sin. They had a free will. They made a bad choice. But he put them in a vulnerable, vulnerable position, just like he had done to his daughter. By not protecting, by not teaching, by not training, by not instilling in them as best he could the ways of the Lord. So we're going to go into chapter 35 just a little bit because I don't want to leave it there. And we'll cover 35 verse by verse in a few weeks when we come back to Genesis. But look at the sixth point. Godly men repent. Verse 1. Then God said to Jacob. Did anybody notice anything about God in chapter 34? You didn't? Because he's not mentioned. He's not quoted. He's not consulted. He's not prayed to. But then God said to Jacob. Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. He's telling you, you've got to go back to Bethel. You've got to go back to where I met you, where I first revealed myself to you. In our terminology, we would say, go back to where you got saved. Go back to a spiritual mountaintop. For those of you who've been in this series, in this study with us for a while, what I'm about to say next should sound familiar, because Abraham did it. He went down to Egypt. He blew it. God never told him to go to Egypt. He made a mess, nearly made a very big mess of his family, lost his wife while he was there. But what did he do? He came back. In Genesis 13, we did the first half of that as a study called Return, Repent, Repeat. Revelation 2, 4, and 5. The words of Jesus to the church at Ephesus. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Jacob was not serving God. He was not obeying God completely. He had trained, by example, his children to do the same. And we get to this point that God in his mercy, God in his grace says, come back. Come back. Turn around. Make a U-turn and come back. 
And he does. Look at verse 2. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. I find comfort in those words. Jacob said to his household, finally, Jacob speaks, and he's doing something proactive, and he's saying something good. And as you continue in the passage, he makes some good decisions and makes progress spiritually. He says, put away the gods, purify yourselves, change your garments, and we'll deal with those more thoroughly next time. But he's finally taking spiritual leadership of his family. says, let's get rid of the false gods. Let's purify ourselves. Let's get rid of what's wrong. What is God leading you to do today? I know a lot of this has been addressed to fathers, to men. Because that's what I see in this passage. I believe that is the direction, certainly the direction that God led me in my study. Today's Montgomery boy said, I do not know the source of Jacob's failures, but I do know where the failures of many of today's fathers come from. They come from being too busy or from being afraid that their children will hate them if they establish discipline and set household laws. If you are a father and have been failing in these areas, reverse it, whatever your children may think. I am not here to condemn dads or men in the room. I've been very encouraged by the interactions I've had with the men of this church, and especially those who've been coming out to our small group. I'm not preaching this and not preaching it this way, thinking, oh, it's just a bunch of losers. I don't think that. But there may be someone whom God is leading to make a decision today. Maybe something I know nothing about. God's saying, you've got to change. You've got to turn. You've got to repent. Maybe that you're making good strides. You're headed the right direction. And God's just adjusting your course a little bit this morning. Maybe looking at these principles of what godly manhood is, is simply reinforcing and encouraging you to keep going. Fathers, what do you need to go home and say to your family today? There may be somebody in this room. There may be somebody watching online. And you need to have a conversation with your wife, with your kids. Do you need to apologize for dropping the ball, for taking your hands off the wheel? Do you need to repent of passivity? Do you need to start taking the spiritual leadership of your home? Or maybe it's kind of slipped something. You need to start again to take the spiritual leadership of your home. you need to apologize to your wife and your kids for blowing it? If so, obey. Obey all the way the way Jacob didn't until chapter 35. What about wives and children? What would you do if your husband, your father, came home and sat everybody down this afternoon and said, there are some things that need to change around here by God's grace. I've already asked him to forgive me, and by his grace, we're going to make some changes. What are you going to do with that? I hope you're not going to resist that. I hope you're not going to throw failure back in his face or say, yeah, we'll see. I've heard that before. Because the children and the wives of the home do a great job of reinforcing and encouraging and cheering on a man who's obeying the Lord. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes?
not going to give an invitation this morning, but I want to be quiet for just a moment. Before we go our separate ways, I want you to take a moment, see if there's something that God is leading you to do. Ask him to search you and know you and reveal anything that's wicked in you. And if he does, repent. It's God telling you this morning, come back to Bethel, come back to me. Maybe there's somebody here, you've never put your faith in Jesus. You've never called on him for salvation. You can do that. He's the savior, he's the rescuer. You simply put your faith in him. Pray and ask him to forgive you. Pray and ask him to save you and he will. Father, you are so faithful to us. You stand with open arms to receive us again and again and again. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for fresh starts. We thank you for calling us back to you. Lord, if there's a man, a woman, a boy or a girl, whom you're leading right now, whom you're speaking to, May he or she obey. Well, repentance is changing our mind about our sin and changing our mind, if necessary, about you in order to come back. Because it would take place in many of our hearts today. I pray in Jesus' name.